Let's take a look at Maxwell's equations again. Let's discuss another concept called displacement current, and we'll see how these two might be related. If you look at how we've used and developed Maxwell's equations up till now, we have the differential form. The first one here is Gauss's law, where this is the electric charge density. This equation here is derived from the fact that there's no magnetic charge, and so there's nothing like rho sub b, so this is equal to zero. Here's Faraday's law, which says that the curl of E is related to the rate of change of b. And here's Ampere's law, which relates the curl of b connected to j. In a way, you could say this, that if you have rho sub b, you're likely to have an E field that's derived from that, if you have a changing B field, you're likely to have an E field. And here, if you have a steady J, you'd have a B field associated with it. While these have integral forms, which often are the, the most useful for making calculations, this is Gauss's law in the integral form. And you can see that you have here a closed surface. And so you have a closed surface like this. If you have Q inside, then the integral of E dot dS over this surface is equal to Q divided by epsilon zero, where Q is the total charge inside. If we don't have any charge associated with B, so Q sub B is zero, then the surface integral of B with respect to dS is equal to zero. And that goes back to what I said, that if we're talking magnetic fields, all of the field lines have to be closed so you don't have sources. Whatever flux enters a surface leaves the surface. So when you do this integral, you get 0. Faraday's law takes on the form of a line integral around a path C. Let me just redraw this. We have path C. And there's some surface that's bounded by C. So here's C, here's S. Then when we take the line integral of E around this path and differentiate B dot dS, which is the flux, through this surface, take the time derivative, and the minus sign just allows us to remember what direction the E field will be in, we'll get this integral here. OK, so here's Ampere's law in the fashion that you're used to. Again, you take a line integral of B dot dL. So let's do it again. Here's a path. Here's the path C. So you integrate B around this path. And so if you have current that is passing through this surface, the total current is I enclosed. And so you get the line integral of B is equal to mu zero I enclosed. So that was useful for symmetric systems to actually find the B. We've used these equations primarily under static conditions. In the case of Faraday's law, we do have a changing field, so it's not static dB dt is not zero. We used it under conditions where the propagation speed was not a factor. So we didn't have to worry about it. By that, we mean, for example, that E that you're interested in is very close to where the B is changing. So we don't worry about how long a change here propagates to the point where we're interested in E. We also derive the continuity equation. So remember, if you conserve charge, then you have this divergence of j is equal to the rate of change of rho with respect to time. So we're going to use this in just a second. Let's go to the case where we have a stationary current distribution. This is constant in time. Then we know that b satisfies this equation. The curl of b is equal to mu zero j. And this is just the differential form of Ampere's law. But let's suppose we have charge distributions and fields changing in time. For example, suppose that the charge density is a function of time and it is not equal to 0. R just tells you what point you're evaluating charge density. If this is non-zero, then obviously the derivative of rho with respect to time will be non-zero. If you go back to our continuity equation, if this is non-zero, then this will be non-zero. That's what we conclude down here, that if we have a rho of t, we're going to have this non-zero. Take a look at this equation here. We have a j here, and let's take the, the divergence of j. We're going to take our mu zero and put it over here. Take the divergence of j right here. And that will be equal to 1 over mu 0 times the divergence of the curl. 
However, if you remember, the divergence of any curl is always equal to zero. So Houston, we have a problem. We've got, in one case, a non-zero part, and over here we have a zero part. We have, obviously, a problem, and so we have to correct Ampere's law. We can look at this in a different way, and that has to do with looking at the region where electric field is changing and there's no charge. If you have a capacitor made of these plates with a gap, let's suppose that we have a charge initially of plus and minus Q, so this is the plus side, this is the minus side. We're going to let that charge dissipate through this resistor and so the current is flowing around this circuit as I show here. So if we're discharging, the plus charge is dropping and the minus charge over here. The charge density, of course, is getting smaller on both sides. Eventually, of course, we'll have zero charge on both these plates. If we take a surface out here, far from the capacitors, C is a path around the conductor the surface that's bound by C will just take this flat surface here. We know if we take this surface and it's bound by the loop C, we can take the flux, B dot DL, around this curve here, and we can change that to a surface integral. So this is just Stokes' theorem. Now the current flowing through S is not zero because this is the current flowing to the capacitor that will be the I enclosed by this surface here. So setting it equal to mu zero I enclosed, the integral that we have here is equal to mu zero I enclosed, and again, that's non-zero. But let's take another surface. For this surface, we're going to consider the same path C surrounding the conductor that has the current I flowing through it. And here's the B that's tangential to the circle. Now we have a new surface which starts here and actually goes into the gap. The way this is drawn it's a little hard to see. I'm trying to just take a cross section like here. So this is like a baggie where the bag is surrounding one of the plates and then comes over here and I'll just pretend like I can draw this. Here's the curve C and this is a new surface S prime. Now if you remember, the integral of b dot ds on this surface versus this surface is the same, just as long as you're subtended by the curve c. So we've got a current flowing here to come to the plate. In the case it was minus, so positive charge is flowing here, so the negative charge is decreasing. The positive charge here is flowing away, so the charge density is dropping again, but there's current in this wire. We know for the old surface, we have a B field out here due to Ampere's law. However, there's no current in between here. There's no charge that can move across this gap. But we do have an E field. Going back to our expression where we change to the surface integral, if we take a different surface, so here's S, let's change to the surface S prime, it should be equal because they are both bound by the curve C. But in this case here, the I enclosed by this surface, so meaning that the I passing through the surface is zero because there's no current out here. In order to patch things up, there must be some kind of current density passing through S prime. And this is where Maxwell reasoned that this should be. So in the gap of the capacitor, there has to be some kind of current so that you can have this quantity be different from zero. Our usual current density outside the gap will remain because we still have that current. But we have to come up with a very unusual J inside the gap. We have the current, the real current out here. We have this very unusual current in the gap and then one out here. And so I've combined the two to give us the relationship between the curl and these uh, current densities. If we take a look at Faraday's law, we found that the curl of E was generated by taking the derivative of B with respect to T. And what it says is that a changing B field generates an E field. So we've got this curl here, but it has no DE dt term. There's nothing that is generating a B field due to a changing quantity, in this case E. 
The two laws, this one and this one, lack symmetry because of the fact that we don't have E producing B. Well, it turns out that relativity demands that. For Maxwell, he just wanted to explain how could it be fixed. And so what he did is he said the unusual J is equal to this quantity right here. So epsilon zero partial of E with respect to time. And the E zero was so that we would have the right units. We combine these then. Here's the curl of B. Here's our usual J. And then we have the unusual J. So in the gap, this is equal to zero because no free charge goes across the gap. But with J usual outside changing with time, the Q on the plates changes with time. So therefore, the E field in the gap changes with time, and so this gives us the non-zero curl of B. What that means is that a B field is in fact generated. Well, let's go back to the divergence of the curl. Remember, we showed that this side of the equation would be zero because the divergence of a curl is always zero. And we're going to be looking at the two terms separately, and because this is so important, we're going to come back to it. I put some asterisks on it. So the left-hand side is zero, as we've already said. So let's consider this term right here. If we take the divergence of that term, I'm just going to switch the order of differentiation. So I'm going to bring the dt outside and put the divergence operator inside. So here's the operation of taking the derivative of now the divergence of e. All I've done is switch the order of the differentiation. But the curl of e by that first Maxwell's equation is rho over epsilon zero. So if we take the divergence of this quantity and put in the charge density, then what we'll have is mu zero epsilon zero times one over epsilon zero times the derivative of rho with respect to time. If we use the continuity equation, we know then that we would have the mu zero del dot j, the real charge motion in the wire, plus mu zero d phi dt equaling zero. And this comes about by the continuity equation. So why is that zero just one more time? Mu zero disappears. We would then have del dot j plus the partial of rho with respect to time. And that will be equal to zero because if you remember the continuity equation, it's this equals minus this. So that's how that works. What this does then is it resolves the issue that we raised before about a non-zero curl when we have this quantity different than zero. By adding this term, the term that is dependent upon the E field changing gives us the condition that we wanted, namely that we can take the divergence, get zero, and we'll have zero on this side over here. So what did Maxwell call this J? I called it J unusual. He called it the displacement's current density. If we integrate over the area, say, of the plates of the capacitor, we would get a current, and that would be called displacement's current. But you can see here that J would be necessarily a density. If you remember that if we have a polarization that's equal to zero, then this thing called the displacement vector is epsilon zero times E. So you can often see that this curl is equal to mu sub zero j plus the partial of d with respect to t. So you might say then that the displacement vector and the displacement current are related as you might imagine. This is a new induction effect where a changing E field generates a B field. So let's look at the direction of this displacement current. For the discharging capacitor, the way I showed you here was that the E field was pointed in this direction from the plus to minus plates. So here's the E field here. But if we're discharging the capacitor, then the direction of partial E with respect to T is in this direction. So that's the direction that we're showing the E field change. It's reducing the magnitude of E, so therefore it has to be in this direction. The J that we have up here, J unusual, is going to be in the direction of partial of E with respect to T. That's in this direction here. 
And if you notice that that's the same direction as the J in the wire, or if you integrate over the area of the wire, cross-sectional area, it's the same direction as the A outside. So it is as if you have real current flowing here, you have displacement current flowing here, and then you have real current flowing here. What I show here is the direction of the J sub D based on the argument that I gave here. So it's in the opposite direction to E only because we're discharging the capacitor. I just wanted to show you this little table that we have in the case of the I different from zero here, out here, we would have no displacement current here. In the gap, we have no real current, but we do have a non-zero displacement current. And then finally, out here, we have I different from zero, and we have displacement current equal to zero. Now realize what I'm saying is that the real current is dQ real over dt, and there's nothing like that in the gap. So we traditionally call Maxwell's equations these equations here. We've already used these. Here's the corrected curl of B, so that's the modified Ampere's law. And this combination is what we call Maxwell's equations. And this is for basically space or materials that have very little permeability or permittivity. Notice that these are for vacuum. I just wanted to point out that it's significant that it turns out that this product here is 1 over the velocity of light squared. So if you take the integral form of Ampere's law, here's the left hand side, here's the right hand side where we have mu zero I enclosed plus mu zero I displacement. I displacement is, as you might expect, the displacement current density integrated over the surface enclosed by C. So in the case of the capacitor, you have a plate, here's the gap. You're talking about then the current density in the gap and then integrating over the area to give you the displacement current. If we then write that in terms of the changing E field, this is the displacement current by taking the displacement current density and integrating over the surface. You can take the derivative outside of the integral, and so you have epsilon zero times the time derivative of this quantity. But that's the electric flux. That's the electric flux through the surface S. So here it is here. Here's the flux as we normally define a flux. And so therefore, the displacement current is equal to epsilon zero times the rate of change of the electric flux with respect to time. So you can also write the integral equation like this. So here's your I enclosed in the outside circuit, and then here's what's happening inside uh, the gap, say, of the capacitor. Well, let's take a example where we just go back to our parallel plate capacitor, but this time, let's take it when it's being charged, and it's charged with a current I. We'll take the plates to be circular with radius capital R and a separation D, and we're going to find the B field between the plates as a function of the radius S. We construct this loop so that it's symmetric relative to, say, the z-axis down the center of the plates. Well, review the charge on the plates and the capacitance are related as CV. The potential is the electric field times D for a parallel plate, and the capacitance is equal to epsilon zero A over D. So we construct this circular loop. It has a radius S. It's between the plates, and it's aligned symmetrically with the capacitor plates. We'll let S be the flat surface enclosed by this curve C. So C is this curve here, and S will be the connecting area between the plates. So we take our new Ampere's law. We have the integral of B dot DL. Remember what we're saying. We have a B in this space here because we're going to have a changing E field. And the integral of that B around this loop will be the left-hand side. That's equal to mu zero I enclosed plus the term here, the displacement current. If we're inside, this is going to be zero. So we'll see how that works out. 
we have i inside equaling zero, so we throw this term away, and we'll mark this equation with asterisk, and then say, okay, the electric flux passing through S will be equal to the E field inside the capacitor times the area pi S squared, and that's the area of the capital S uh, enclosed by C. Well, the capacitance gives us a E field when it's charged, and so we'll have E equaling the charge density on one of the plates divided by epsilon zero, and the charge density is just the Q on the plate divided by the area of the plate, and then the epsilon zero is here. This is just charge over area, which gives us sigma, and then the epsilon zero. So if we take the flux then, the flux here and differentiate it with respect to dt, that will be equal to the d dt of the E field inside the capacitor times the area enclosed by C. So here's the E and then here's the area. Realize that this is constant. We're only talking about the differential of this quantity here. Well, the only thing that can change is the charge on the plate. I put in the derivative that we end up with here, and then everything else stays the same, s squared over epsilon zero r squared. This is the current outside. So we have i outside s squared over epsilon zero r squared. So the change of flux inside the capacitor is equal to i outside times the ratio of s squared over r squared and one over epsilon zero. So if you go back to our equation three asterisk, remember in the gap we have no i outside. So we have B induced times two pi s, which is the distance around the path C, equaling the right hand side of the equation, which is mu zero epsilon zero times the derivative of the flux with respect to time, which is this quantity right here. So sticking that in here, we have the right-hand side. Now I've made the steps that give you the argument of the scalar equations in terms of vectors. Basically, I've skipped them, but I think you can see that because of the symmetry, B and DL are going to be parallel, and so we end up with a simple scalar equation. We integrate around the path, and that gives us the 2 pi s. B induced is constant along that path. So solve for B induced, simplify it, and we have then that we have mu zero times I outside, and then S, two pi R squared in the bottom, and all of this is for S less than R, so we are staying within the gap in order to get this result. So as you go out from the center, you are getting more and more B field until you hit the edge. So that's what this equation is telling us. It goes proportional to the distance from the center and increases until you reach capital R. What about the direction of B? Well, first of all, we know that it's tangential to the loop. We have to say, well, which way is E increasing? Here's E shown schematically, and we're charging the capacitor. This plate is becoming more positive. This plate is more negative. E is in this direction, and so is the E with respect to time. Del E with respect to time is in this direction because we're charging the plates. So down here, E is increasing in the plus Z direction. The displacement current density is in the plus Z direction. And so then you use the right-hand rule. That gives you the direction of B. If this is the part of the loop that's towards us, and this is in the back, then the right-hand rule will give us the B field pointing in this direction like that. And so you'd have circles of B inside the capacitor that look somewhat like what I'm drawing here. What about S greater than R, so that we're at a distance further away than the radius of the plates? So I've drawn a curve C again at a distance S from the symmetry axis. There's E field only between the plates, so as soon as you go out here, there's no electric field. But we certainly have a flux, an electric flux, contained inside the plates, 
and so therefore there is flux passing through the surface that is defined by the loop C. If we're at S greater than R, position so that capital S is still in the gap, meaning that if you look sideways, here's the gap, and I'll just draw the cross-section of this curve C, we're outside of the plates, but our coordinate in this direction is within the plates. And so the assumption is that all of the B field that is generated here is only due to the change in the electric field between the plates. It's not going to be influenced by the current out here. And the idea here is that these are circles, this is a circle, and they just don't overlap in terms of the B field. Our flux then that is passing through the surface S is going to be equal to the, the E field that is inside the gap times the area of the plates. You have an E field inside. The E field is non-zero only out to S equal capital R. So that's why we use pi r squared as the area. Well, that's equal to the Q of the plate over epsilon zero, if you take all the parameters and simplify. That looks pretty simple. It's related, of course, to the E field. The pi r squared over pi r squared is equal to one, so that's why we end up with this relation. Going back to our integral, and again making the assumptions of things being parallel and so on, we have the B induced out beyond the plates, still a function of S, times the length of the line around C, which is still 2 pi s, will be equal to our mu zero epsilon zero. We'll take our derivative again, and that will give us a current, which will be d outside. See, we're taking the derivative of q with respect to time. And as we said before, that's the i outside. So again, if you simplify this, then the B induced in this at a position outside of the plates, but in between the plates in terms of the Z parameter, will be equal to, hmm, look at that, mu zero I outside over two pi S. This is like a wire that has I outside. I outside here, the displacement current here, and then the real current here. This i and this i are equal in magnitude, and so you end up with as if this was not even there. It's just a wire with the current i flowing across it. So let's evaluate our Maxwell's equations in free space. By that we mean that there's no bulk charge density, there's no current density, there's no free charge density on a surface, and we have, of course, that our epsilon zero mu zero is one over c squared. Putting in all these conditions into Maxwell's equations, they simplify. We have these two divergence equations, both being zero. And then we have these two curl equations. So this is Faraday's law here, and this is our modified Ampere's law, where we've thrown away the J in wires and things like that. So this is in just free space. These two equations here, if you take them and put them together, you can actually show that you have a wave solution. You have a wave equation for E and for B. And what they generate is a curve like this, and I say let there be light. So the last two equations yield the wave equation for electromagnetic waves it needs the displacement current term. It needs this term in order to give you the wave behavior. Well, as you can imagine, this was a real triumph for Maxwell. I'm not sure, but I think he predicted that this was independent of frequency. So if you are in the frequencies of light, it works. If you go to radio uh, frequencies, it also works. It was not until Hertz actually showed that you could produce radio waves at much lower frequencies, but it still obeys these equations here.